Hello and welcome to Rejected Religion Spotlight. I'm Stephanie Shea. My guest today is Freik Wallach. Welcome, Freik. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm very glad to, to talk with you today. If you'll allow me to give a short introduction for the audience. Of course. Great. Freik is a poet, writer, painter, cultural organizer, and political scientist who lives and works in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Uh, his work centers on the dynamics of more obscure areas of life where counterculture meets the occult. Freik and I know each other uh, via Instagram, and uh, Freik uh, reached out to me recently to ask about getting together for an interview, to which I happily agreed, because I'm very interested to talk with you, Freik, to get to know you a little bit better and, uh, and what you're doing. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have the opportunity to see any of your presentations because uh, you've given some uh, recently. Uh, so I'm not very familiar with what you're doing in particular, but this is a great opportunity f for me to find out more. Uh, so I have questions, of course. The first being uh, regarding your work with counter or alternative cultures. Uh, could you expand on what you mean uh, when you use these terms and how these sometimes obscure areas are intersecting with occult ideas? And just feel free to share uh, whatever whatever comes up <laughs> in your mind. <laughs> Be careful of that. I might just go full stream of consciousness here and make it one massive editing nightmare. Totally, uh, yeah, totally fine. Um, I got... Of course, through Amsterdam Hermetica and some uh, mutual acquaintances, people told me I had to do this. Um, and I <laughs> really love your work on counterculture in the past and on Ginsburg. Uh, Thank you. That whole, that whole lot, so to speak. So this felt like a very natural uh, connection. Yeah. And when I write about counterculture, um, you immediately get caught in you know, the dilemma of debate. Is calling it counterculture not necessarily... Um, giving it the power dynamics that you know, I try to address in my writing? by calling it, you know, subversive culture or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, the way I see it, at least in uh, my writing and in my research, is culture that by its very existence is in some way, shape, or form a threat to a powerful status quo. That is to say, cultural capital isn't something, you know, with a universal uh, value. It's not like money or cash where you can just put a number on it. And at the end of the day, it's always being valued in the process of creation, in the process of judgment, uh, which is where power dynamics come into play. And mm -hmm. a lot of forms of culture, uh, whether it's specific cultural communities, which have been uh, subjugated historically, whether it's uh, certain concepts or ideas that you know challenge, let's say, white patriarchal uh, societal norms uh, when it comes to, let's say, gender and culture, when it comes to, say, art and politics. Um, that's, in my mind, is counterculture. And where those power dynamics kind of you know come into fruition and how that changes the way we value certain specific uh, cultural expressions, that's where I concern myself with. Okay, so that's uh, a little bit different perhaps than the, uh, like the 60s counterculture meaning uh, of what people understand about that. Well, I think that the 60s counterculture movement is a very uh, telling example of counterculture in a broader sense. It's kind of, mm -hmm. of course, the whole terminology of counterculture mm -hmm, uh, came mm -hmm. the limelight during the 60s uh, and of course a little earlier a little later but we immediately associated with the uh, hippie movement right, with the civil yeah. rights movement yeah. um because you know let, i mean uh, let's not kid ourselves the presence of on the one hand psychedelic and pacifism and on the other hand you know strong black voices demanding justice were by their very existence a threat to the power dynamics that had ruled the united states for centuries are still mm -hmm. room in the United States for centuries. So in that sense, it was again, just simply by being um, a potential danger to others in charge. And I think if you look at it now, you can look to the climate movement uh, mm -hmm. or you can look at which, you know, something which I found very telling, the presence of uh, squatting centers producing art. Art from squatting venues has historically, at least in my city, been an immense source of cultural capital for the city. However, since squatting is still technically illegal, um, it shouldn't exist in the first place. I'm very glad it does. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we should defend it. 
But, you know, looking at certain radical movements and their cultural expressions, I think that very much ties into the philosophy behind the 60s counterculture movement, Mm -hmm. while allowing us to view different dynamics reaching from, you know, occult practices in the Renaissance to uh, movements by young rebellious artists today. Right. So for what I'm getting uh, from you is that this is more of a nuanced and also more diverse um, type of topic that we're uh, that's we're engaging with right now at least yeah, I you think are maybe we should make the difference between counterculture with a capital c being yeah, yeah. you know these 60s ginsburgian bob mm-hmm. dylan uh, you know, uh, can i can i swear of course <laughs> well let's let's go with screw the man simply you know, to make it all a bit uh, <laughs> and we have capital c counterculture specific to, you know, referring right. to work specific period and then counterculture in its broader sense is simply being subversive culture kind of on the balance between opacity and boldness right right okay so that's very clear now for me as well hopefully for the for the audience as well so now uh with the with regard to the question of how esotericism or occultism might be influencing our current society so with that question in mind in your research as a political scientist as well as with your work uh, as a cultural organizer I was wondering if you are finding that quote unquote esoteric concepts or occult concepts, and by this I mean those approaches that are found outside of the traditional monotheistic ideologies, uh, if you find that these concepts are found more often in the making of policies or in the types of themes, for example, that are, that particular groups are currently finding relevant. So I guess I'm just, that's a really difficult and, and kind of convoluted way of asking no, you know, no, do please, you find please, this in the in your work that you're doing <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it's a very interesting one because when you're looking at the debate of policy making uh, which is something with my uh, professional backgrounds which I've done quite a bit um, there is a uh, clear separation between anything occult esoteric and what is translated into policy because policy is you know supposed to be founded on uh, you know, verifiable facts, whereas uh, occultists are often going into spe- exactly these areas where those facts are, by their very nature, not present. Um, not even going into the whole moral panic of, you know, Satanism, occultism, uh, where no politician would ever willingly touch those subjects, <laughs> exactly. even though it might be very valuable sources of uh, policymaking knowledge. Mm. What I find even more interesting is seeing how throughout history you see these uh, patterns repeating themselves of mm. a institution having a certain amount of intellectual capital and a monopoly on the truth, let's say the Catholic Church throughout the centuries, and then having someone like Della Porta emerge who wanted, you know, to uh, explain these supernatural phenomena through natural magic, and which in that time was one of the most scientific methods uh, available to people, and him being a you know, clear affront to the monopoly of the church. So it's very often not even as much about what specifically people are saying, it's who they are saying it to and who doesn't want them to say those things. Um, It's a threat to, you know, a very platonic view of leadership. And I think that's where it comes into play. Um, There is this very strong dogma ever since Plato, but reading the works of Hannah Arendt or Foucault, that you know, kind of devised these means of neoplatonic leadership where having some, you know, irrefutable source of truth was the essential power at hand for, let's say, the Catholic Church. But, I mean, to a lesser degree, universities, uh, massive media conglomerates, there is a, of of course, there's a very clear battlefield of who gets to decide what is true and what isn't. And I think that in the policymaking process, it's very easy, you know, considering the political dimension of it, to have an opinion and propose it as a fact or have it the other way around, where there are irrefutable facts, let's say, concerning climate change, let's say, uh, concerning uh, historic prejudices, where it's easier to ignore, and therefore you're not refuting the statement, you are refuting the person saying it, uh, which is, you know, there I saw some very interesting interviews throughout the years with representatives of the Satanic Church, where they were, you know, very eloquent intellectual people yeah. who made some very eloquent intellectual points, so they're not attacking their actual statements or the quality of their arguments, they're attacking what they are supposedly representing. And who gets to decide what is, you know, valuable knowledge and what is, you know, uh, valueless knowledge is by default a very political process which determines, you know, value in the art sphere. Right. 
that's a good point about the uh, satanic. It's the satanic temple, isn't it? There's a yes, a you're absolutely different right. names, correct? Okay, I didn't want to get confused and, and mix up the names because they're no, separate. No, it's just my blue-filled head who's still No, 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 no. But I just wanted to make certain that we're talking about the same thing, that I understand yeah, yeah, yeah. from you the same thing. Um, more on a personal level, you're a, a poet, you're an artist. Um, I was curious, where does your own personal interest in esoteric or uh, occult ideas, where does this stem from? I think it might be twofold. On the one hand, I am... Um, I know I've always been concerned with how we judge certain cultural expressions by communities that have, you know, historically been pushed aside. I come from a Jewish family, come from a family of Jewish artists um, whose livelihoods were constantly threatened by them being Jewish. And yeah. they made some beautiful works of art who were either, you know, claimed by, um, <clears throat> well, by lack of a better word, Aryan writers, as the, you know, news reports of the time made very clear. Um, but it goes even back even further than that. There's this very... Uh, telling quote in reference to the Christian adoption of uh, Jewish mysticism, mm. which was that it should at the end of the day lend itself as being a spear with which to pierce the Jews. Um, again, a literal quotation. Um, so knowledge is a weapon and who chooses to weaponize it is something which has been very relevant to my family and to myself throughout uh, the years. So on the one hand, you know, there's a very clear sense of, you know, let's call it activist motivation, where I feel like addressing these issues is necessary to, you know, maybe help, uh, you know, come into help into fruition some new forms of appreciation for uh, cultural expressions by communities that haven't always gotten the uh, credit that they deserve. Mm. On the other hand, I was raised by an archaeologist. So I spent a lot of time growing up on ancient digging sites, and I was just as a child mystified by the presence of so many combating ideas. And I just think the battlefield of where, you know, different ideas, philosophies, ideas come to be is just endlessly fascinating. And it says a lot about the society which we are. I think it's very much a reflection of the zeitgeist of the time, which ideas are considered valuable and which aren't. Yeah, that's very interesting how you're... Uh, your family background and the things that your your family is doing is also influencing your uh, yeah your ideas about uh, about culture as well, not just on a personal level, but larger uh, you know larger issues as well. I think that's uh, really interesting. Well, if I can give a, a personal example, sure. Uh, my great grandfather was a journalist. Um, who had worked ceaselessly on this translation of a very famous Dutch uh, author, uh, Jos Wondel, um, which I think it came out in 41, 42. He uh, was Jewish. It must have been 41. Um, and it worked on, he had worked on that for like a decade. And it was a brilliant piece of translation. However, after it was published, he came, you know, became the victim of a Nazi mock trial where they alleged that he had stolen it all from, again, quote, an Aryan writer, and that all of this would prove once and for all the Jewish incapability of translating the great German and Dutch masterpieces. Um, later on, his work was copied by other people who you know, properly referenced him, but since it was considered a very nicely done, modern for the time translation. Um, Instead of it being viewed as, you know, a new valuable form of culture, uh, of cultural capital, it was, you know, brutally taken from him. Um, mm. It is, you know, a fate which has fallen upon a lot of communities where they have created things of beauty. And in the worst case, uh, the credit has been stolen. It's being you know, produced on a mass scale. And the fruits of that labor never get back into the hands of the communities that created it. So I think that's a very, uh, yeah, it's, I think it's a very relevant discussion since we are often living under the presumption that things are fundamentally different now than they have been for the last 500 years, whereas things are, yes, indeed, very fundamentally different, but some things don't seem to go away, at least not without a fight. Very good point that you make there. So... I'd like to move on to your own personal uh, work with your presentations. Uh, uh, you recently presented at the Occulture Conference in Berlin. Unfortunately, yes. I wasn't able to attend that, so I missed uh, all of that well, wonderful I stuff. Next year. Uh, was a fun <laughs> Would you share a little bit about what you talked about there? Because uh, you, you, um, 
you shared some information with me uh, prior to our to our discussion today, and I was you know, just really curious. I didn't know if maybe that was something that you could uh, that you could share with me today. Of course, yeah. Um, so, uh, as my main passion, as my main profession, I am a poet. So, when I do these presentations, they are uh, these shows of poetry just to make sure that those who haven't seen my work uh, at least know somewhat what I'm uh, yeah, talking about, yeah. um, where I try to blend rhythm, music, poetry, storytelling, uh, all these different kind of mediums, and try it to be informed by different uh, practices, uh, which I've encountered over the years. So uh, as of the last few years, I've become very interested to see which tactics used in meditation and hypnotism may be applicable to uh, poetry. Since it's all very much about rhythm, it's about concocting images in the mind, it's about trying to connect to an audience, um, I think that's all very interesting. What I try to do is, or at least have been trying to do for the last few years, is from my interviews with those who dictate nightlife, whether it be bouncers, bartenders, sex workers, artists, musicians, you name it, trying to tell the story of Amsterdam in small, trying to tell the story of cities, I've interviewed people in Iran, I've interviewed people in Liverpool, uh, Latvia, and it's all very much been a part of trying to connect all these different experiences. And then through my poetry, I try to, in my own small way, find the words and find language to hopefully engage an audience and kind of share a little bit of the world uh, which I've experienced and which I hope others get to experience too. That sounds and coming from the punk scene... Uh, it's all very loud and all very <laughs> in your face and all very, uh, yeah. Great, I mean, that it, sounds it's, it's great. Not, I try it for it to not be your average uh, literature evening. Understood. Um, <laughs> Understood. Yeah, maybe if I get into too much detail, I'll get myself into trouble. So, uh, <laughs> oh, I doubt it. I doubt it. Not here anyway, not with me. You, you're going to be presenting soon in March uh, at the Death and Rebirth Festival. It's uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, and this festival deals with, uh, I'm sorry, not the festival, but your presentation will be dealing with, uh, quoting you, the crossroads of mysticism, opacity, and radical queer and alternative culture, end quote. So could yes. you give us a little peek into your presentation? That's what I'm asking for. <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm going to be doing uh, two shows there, uh, at the opening day and at the closing day, um, as part of the opening and closing ceremonies. Um, and I had been asked to prepare a presentation uh, for the first day on the concept of death. And on the final day, I was asked to present on the concept of rebirth. Um, so... My primary focus has always been the uh, cultural and political dynamics of underground art in the city. Um, so on the one hand, I'm going to be talking about the idea of a dying city, which is something which to the Amsterdam context is very relevant since our city has been you know, deemed the next Venice. And living here, it's, there are very often talks about the durability of the Amsterdam spirit and how open and inclusive the city can actually remain for the, you know, the coming decades. Um, which is, of course, very, very relevant to nightlife, which challenges the status quo, which is where the whole radical culture, queer culture, alternative underground culture comes into play, since those are often the first uh, victims of gentrification and the first victims of commodification. And on the final day, I'm going to be discussing cities as you know, uh, realms or places of rebirth, of self-exploration, of rejuvenation, of change. Um, so it's going to be dealing with two different aspects of the changing city, the one being our change within the city, uh, Amsterdam specifically, and the other hand being the change Amsterdam itself is going through and how that will reflect upon us as communities. That sounds fascinating. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> I'm sure it will be. Early. Maybe this is all going up like a week before I have my biggest blunder ever on stage. And then, you know... Famous lost words. Oh, I, d I doubt it. I doubt it. I yeah, think everything's going to go fine. I was wondering, I don't know if you can uh, answer this question or not, but um, what's the idea behind the festival itself? I mean, or the framework, so to speak. I, I, mean, I know it's an international uh, lineup because some of uh, other acquaintances of mine are going to be presenting as well. And I was, didn't know if maybe you could tell just a little bit more about the idea behind the, the festival itself. Of course, yeah. Um, so I'm not part of the organization. Right, uh, right, yeah. So everything I say uh, is 
you're bound to be biased by my very uh, <laughs> by my very being. No, um, it wants to combine all these different cultural uh, traditions. So it's going to be a ritualistic art on the one hand. It's going to be punk art, where you know, where I'm coming in. Um, it's going to be all these different uh, artistic practices. So it's going to be visual art. It's going to be music. Um, there are going to be presentations, obviously, um, but it's also very much tied to the neighborhood it's in. It's going to be um, at the NDSM dock, which is, you know, historically a very important um, alternative art hub here in the city. So we're definitely going, and it's, you know, my neighborhood, Amsterdam North. Um, so we're going to be celebrating the neighborhood. So we're going to be inviting a lot of people from the community um, inside as to, you know, again, make these new connections and make sure that people... Uh, hopefully leave with a different view of uh, art than they entered. Uh, now, that's, of course, you know, everybody's aim when organizing an art festival. Uh, so in that sense, we're not that unique. No, um, I think it's going to be fun. I know a big part of the of the lineup. Um, there are, you know, wonderful people who do some very exciting stuff. Um, and I think the concept of it being about death, about rebirth, and about ritual, and kind of having that as the handle to explore a city and indeed a very international perspective on art. Um, so yeah, I think people should just come down. Uh, there's going to be beautiful visual art, which I think is coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, there are going to be like uh, little sneak peeks mm-hmm, on mm-hmm. the rebirth page. So I think, yeah, if people have the opportunity, I would definitely just advise them to come by. Yes, indeed. Um I was asking you about uh, before about if you know if you could talk a little bit about what you're going to be doing, uh, but to bring esotericism into uh, the the discussion, as you know, I like to do. Uh, oh, <laughs> could you talk a bit I'm more? Waiting of, for it. <laughs> great, <laughs> this is perfect opportunity. Then um, you have, uh, of course, your your Jewish heritage, and could you talk more about how Jewish mysticism is? playing a part in your in your presentation or presentations um, of course of course um i think well i mean uh, let's look at a certain concept central to jewish mysticism any mystical tradition is very diffuse and uh, there isn't a uniform jewish myth you know there isn't a one uniform jewish mystical tradition there are right, countless right. communities who yeah. have, of course yeah. looked at different traditions differently uh, and i of course on the one hand, being an Ashkenazi Jew, on the other hand, being an Amsterdam Jew and being a relatively secular Jew um, are bound to look at their things differently than, let's say, uh, an Hasidic Jew in uh, Israel. Yes. For me, certain central concepts of Jewish mysticism are about the relationship between what is hidden and what is shown. If you look at the divine, so to speak, uh, even as an atheist, um, you can see it as being a certain sense of uh, interconnectedness, you know, a uh, the defined simplicity of God being in everything and in being in everyone, you know, the idea is that God Spinoza evicted from the uh, Sephardic Jewish community, but luckily have gotten, gotten a bit of redemption in the uh, centuries that followed. Um, there's also, you see, uh, something returning with Edouard Glissant, who was this great uh, anti-colonial philosopher who... Uh, talked about opacity and about uh, the Western bias of trying to understand that which you don't understand. And that to a certain degree, that's all, you know, beautiful and rational and you name it, but it can take away a little bit of the magic and of the beauty. And especially when we're doing it to other people, uh, it automatically makes us grade them. It makes us uh, box them up. It makes us uh, want to understand them, even though we are such an interconnected mess through our lives, that to understand somebody, to truly, fully understand somebody, he claimed, you would have to understand everybody they have ever met, everybody they have ever met, how all those different interactions shaped a human being, their you know, their internal monologue, their emotions, um, which, as he calls it, distracts us from the divine weave, um, which you know mirrors a lot of beliefs found in Jewish mysticism that we are all connected and that it is sometimes better to try to not understand what is going on and instead just you know surrender ourselves to it, um, and that through hiding away certain parts of ourselves we are actually opening ourselves up to being more connected. Uh, if you see Jewish prayer in the mystical tradition as a way of getting close to the divine, and the divine is found in all of us and this prayer is obtained through withdrawing us from the outside world. There's a very weird dichotomy of withdrawing yourself to actually connect to the world around you. And I think that's a very beautiful idea. 
which mirrors a lot of the historical experiences of the Jewish community. There's one other aspect, at least in my uh, in my lessons that I would have about uh, Jewish mysticism at the university, um, about this quality of the mystical experience that can't be uh, communicated. So yeah. how, as an artist, are you trying to, I, I don't maybe you're not, I don't know if this is even important to you, I'm just asking. Such bold assumptions. <laughs> if, if there is any type of... Um, uh, uh, attention or approach that you're, that you're trying to, uh, convey that there is this, um, ineffable side of things. Very much so. Um, in my poetry, I try to connect these modern movements to certain classical, biblical, uh, mythological tropes. Not, not only because they land for beautiful pictures, but also because I hope to evoke a certain sense that we are dealing with something uh, beyond ourselves. There's this poem, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Cole Abramson. He runs mm -hmm. uh, The Vendor's Wolf, and yep. him and I got stayed in touch after a culture, and it's now going to feature one of my poems, uh, Released from Eden, which is trying to build on the uh, conceptualization of Irish from about, you know, the uh, release from freedom, the uh, positive and negative freedom, um, and by connecting that to a modern retelling of the Garden of Eden myth, I try to evoke this certain, like, you know, almost ancestral feeling baked into us from, uh, from birth, through education, through media. Um, so, yeah, I think evoking those tropes is a very interesting way of hopefully getting people's minds in the right mindset, at least. Uh, the one I had in mind when making the poetry. On the other hand, with my visual art, I often try utilizing certain symbolic languages which, which have either been forgotten or have been uh, weaponized by the church or by other um, intellectual institutions or cultural institutions because I'm very fascinated by uh, power structures which absorb cultural expressions which they don't fully understand, which mm -hmm. is the reason why when you walk into a Catholic basilica, it's beautiful, it's ornamental, uh, but it loses any sense of cohesive narrative because it's not supposed to be cohesive, it's just supposed to be everything all together, all at once. Um, and I think that's very interesting to work on that. And it's yeah. a stark contrast to, let's say, more nuanced cultural expressions by the original or the indigenous uh, communities from which these icons have been taken, who place them into the right context. And through that, we're able to create something beautiful, which lacks the, you know, idiotic decadence of a lot of, you know, mm. powerful propagandist architecture. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Your poem, uh, you mentioned Fenris Wolf. Is it going to be published in the new in the newest edition, or has it already been published? Yes, for as I can tell, it, it will be. Yes, in the new edition that's coming yes. soon. Okay, great. I will be certain to include the link to that, so anyone who's interested in uh, obtaining a copy of the new Fenris Wolf when it comes out. They can do so. So, getting back to the uh, the festival in Amsterdam. If people are going to be in the area, or they already uh, they already live in the area, is it possible for anyone to attend this festival, or is it uh, kind of uh, for a selected audience only? No, no, it's not. It's not gate capped at all. Uh, people okay. are welcome to drop by. Uh, the more the merrier. Okay. Uh, I don't know what the deal is with the ticket sale. I knew know there were early bird tickets. I think that or those have already sold out quite quickly. Um, but for the most part, it's available. You can buy a day ticket. Um, you can buy a, a festival pass. I really think uh, knowing the organization uh, and you know, having been in discussion with them in the run-up to my set, um, that they really want to make it as inclusive as possible. Um, on the one hand, with the lineup, but on the other hand, very importantly, with those who were able to attend. So yeah. I think that especially if people feel like, all right, I want to get into this all a bit more, but I don't know where to start. I feel like with the very diverse lineup and the diverse collection of people there, it's going to be a very, uh, well, not, I don't want to say low key, but it's going to be a very low key way of. Uh, An yeah, easy way to get into bit. it. Very much. Yeah. Easy way. <laughs> Great. Yes, the audience doesn't know how badly I've slept for the last uh, few days. Uh, You're fine. You're totally fine. Oh, poor little. <laughs> So in closing, where can people find you? Of course, you're on Instagram, uh, but where can people find you online and, and find out more about your work? Are there other areas where you're, uh, where you're, where people can find you? 
it's most streamlined through my uh, Instagram page. Okay. I uh, perform regularly. Uh, that's something they can all check out. I'm also I at the day at the moment where this comes up, um, hopefully still in a running for the Nightmareship of Amsterdam. So if people are interested in getting more involved into the political side of nightlife and wanting to, you know, uh, well, at least, you know, share my vision of trying to protect these occult or uh, marginalized uh, cultural communities, I highly recommend them to get involved in the process of the whole new night council or night politics in general. Um, since it's always very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, people can find out about me through Red Light Art and Culture. It's the uh, cultural organization of the Red Light District, for which I'm currently their in-house poet. Um, yeah. Wow. I think I'm uh, I'm trying to be more uh, <laughs> more out there on the internet. Yeah, um, great. All right. Well, I will be sure to include all of uh, all of the links to to all of those uh, those groups and uh, and organizations and and websites. That you've mentioned, uh, of course, death and rebirth will be uh, will be included. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to thank you for for reaching out to me and for spending some time with me today to talk about what you're doing and, uh, yeah, helping me to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, this is kind of our uh, yeah get to know you session, I guess, <laughs> in that regard. So, I just wanted to thank you for for being here with me today. It was a pleasure to make your acquaintance, and uh, thank you very much for the interest in my work. It's uh, I've seen a bit more interest uh, as of the last few months, and it's been a very, very nice experience to meet so many new people. So I've, this was very cool. Thank Great. You. Well, it was my pleasure, and I would just like to wish you good luck with the with the festival, with your presentations, and with your research projects, and uh, just in general with everything that you're doing, because it sounds super, super interesting. Well, thank you. Uh, let's stay in touch. I would like that very much.